Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. I think we are now live streaming again for round two <laughs> with our man, Jay Wynn, Jamie Winborn. Thank you, Jamie, for making some time for us again tonight. I really enjoyed our conversation from last night, and I'm hoping we'll, we'll be able to finish it tonight. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it too, man. I got a, I got a lot of... Uh... A lot of good comments and uh, a lot of good reactions to it, man. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad people, you know, able to, you know, check in and um, see what we got going on here. That's right. Well, it's it's good to see you. And, and you were in the middle of such a, a fascinating story. And it sounded like it really was a, a life changing moment for you that we all have at some point in an, or another in their in our lives. But where we had cut out last night, guys, is Jamie, you were telling us about a conversation that you had had not only with a professor, but then with a, a dean that ultimately propelled you to make a decision about heading into the draft. So I want you to take us back to there. And when did you decide to tell your teammates that it was time, that you had changed your mind and this was what was going on in your head? Well, that was yesterday I said, uh, after uh, I might left that meeting with the, with the dean, um, you know, like I said, I, I didn't feel like I was going to have a good opportunity to even make it to the next level. You know, I just I just thought that was something that I was involved with that I really didn't have control over at that time. I, I didn't, you know, if I had an A in a class and you know, there are threats to take me off the field just if I miss one class and I have three absences that I can take. I just felt like that's just a realm that I don't want to be in, and um, I'm gonna avoid all of that and and just go ahead and enter the draft. So, I, 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 you know, when I told Woody about that situation or whatever, I told Woody that I was gonna probably leave, and you know, Woody, Woody was behind me 100, percent you know, um, you know, and but he he just knew that you know, it meant a lot for me to graduate um, in regard to my family and stuff, and my mom, you know, that was kind of like a promise I had made to her. But, you know, I, I just said I'd have to, you know, let them know the situation and that I will come back and, and finish. But, you know, ultimately, it's my life. I got to do what I think is best. Mm -hmm. And so when I left the office, then, you know, I was kind of messed up a little bit. Like, you know, just, you know, my mind was just kind of, you know, I was just still I still couldn't believe that, you know, something like that had happened, uh, you know. The guy telling me, you know, his job's tenure and all that good stuff um, and, and threats of taking me off the field. So. You know, a lot of the guys was like, you know, ask me what's wrong with you, you know, and I was telling them, man, you know, I just decided I'm going to leave. And, uh, you know, a lot of my close friends knew about the conversation that the dean and I had, but I didn't really want to put it out there, you know, majorly. And, and you know, a lot of only only my close friends to this day even know about that. And, you know, Coach Woody and a couple of coaches and stuff, but um, I, I don't I don't really bring it up very, very often, you know not really trying to, you know, make, make it seem bad or anything like that, but you know, that's just the truth and what it would happen at the time. So. Well, you had to make a decision that was best for yourself. You took back control of your yeah. situation. And I, I, I applaud that because that's, that was not an easy thing for you to do. I know because you ultimately had to make that decision. You had to tell the head coach of the program. You had to tell all your buddies on the team. You had to tell your mama. And you had to go forward with that because once you declare, you're done as far as, as college is concerned. Now, how much time did you have to prepare for the draft? How did you get the word out? Did you quickly get an agent? I mean, that's, you had to do a lot of stuff in a hurry, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I actually did. Um, but, I mean, it wasn't – I still had time, you know, to do the training and stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously at that time, you know, agents were already calling left and right. I just – was kind of ignoring them, you know, mm -hmm. and um, telling them, you know, I, w I probably wasn't coming out anyway. So, you know, that's what I was telling them. But as soon as I, as soon as I made that decision, um, you know, now I started to answer those calls with a little bit more business mind to it um, and ended up going with a, a, a guy of, uh, of um, Atlanta, Georgia here, a um, guy named Terry Bolar, mm -hmm. which is also, you know, he's a, he's a relative to LeBron James. Um, but um, he was a good dude, um, you know, and the, the main thing I was worried about was just, you know, 
was the training aspect because you know I needed to put up some good times for the pro for the for the scouts and stuff like that. You know, because you know my my film play is what it is. That's that's gone. Now I gotta you know I'm I'm thrown into this pool with a, with, with some of the best players in the, in the country, and I, I need to perform. And um, but I felt it best to stay and train right where I was and and uh, train with Todd Suttles, who I was you know most close to. Sure. And um, you know I done, he done a great job with me my entire time there. So I didn't feel the need to uh, change up. But um, yeah, but I but I I just trained every day and uh, you know just took it took it took it took the attitude and took the approach of a pro, and you know all day long that's all I did you know mm-hmm. stretching and, and and going and seeing doctors and stuff like that and uh, you know just getting ready to to get get ready for the combine. Well, that became you you essentially became a professional when you decided to declare, and that became your job. Instead of being a full-time student and, and athlete, you know, student athlete, you are now an athlete, a professional, soon to be. Um, where where were you when you, I guess, where did you watch the draft or were you with family, friends? Do you remember that evening or that phone call you got from the Niners? Yeah, I was I was actually at my agent's house in uh in Atlanta here. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it was crazy. Um because I, I, the night before, I was telling somebody else this story. I had, I had, I had, I had a hotel. I had a whole floor almost on a hotel, and I had all my cousins up here from Alabama and family members and stuff like that, and um, you know, and a couple other pro guys that you know were in the pros already. But you know, we just had a lot going on at the hotel. So I had all these expensive cars and stuff outside the hotel, and um, you know, guys, you know. And it, it's kind of crazy how this happens, but we got kicked out of the hotel because the police came and said that they had, they thought that there was some that they had reason to believe that we had some kind of drug, um, uh, some dealing with drugs going on here, like we were making a drug deal or something. And I and I, I understood what they were saying. You know, they had no real reason for it. I sure. mean, you know, it is it's probably a couple million dollars worth of cars out in the parking lot. And, a lot of black people, but mm-hmm. ain't no drugs up here, man. This is the I'm getting drafted, but see that and that and that was the thing. But so we yeah. ended up getting kicked out of that entire hotel. I just told everybody, man, we're just gonna leave, and you know we don't want no problems here and all that good stuff. But so we ended up going to another hotel. But um, I just thought that was funny how that how that happened. Mm-hmm. When I think back on all of this stuff to this day, now I'm like, wow, that was crazy. But uh, <laughs> well, oh. yeah, with all the stuff. Oh, you know, you ignore stuff, you know, you try to just, you know, my mind has always been move on, keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Don't let anything get you down. Don't look at it that, you know, look at everything in a positive aspect. But now that I look back on this stuff and I'm just like, you know, it's kind of crazy. We got, I, I, they didn't refund me my money out of those, all of those rooms or any of that. But, yeah. but anyway, yeah, I watched the draft at my agent's house and, um, you know, there was, I, I can't remember the guy's name. But he was an offensive lineman, a tackle, and a, a real phenomenal talent. But he kept dropping in the draft. Uh, something happened, like they showed something with him smoking a bong or something like that. Oh, it was Laramie. It wasn't Laramie Tunsil, was it? I can't remember exactly who it was, man. Um, I had an old miss. Du- uh, Dwayne, I bet you, you you'd remember this. I can't remember. But you remember Laramie Tunsil was at an old miss and they caught him. Somebody put on Instagram. He was smoking that, I think, a bomb. That, I think that's way. him. Exactly. So, you know, you know, I've been good friends with Corey Chavis and, um, you know, been on the phone with Mel Kuyper and all those guys. So I kind of understood the draft process. And I knew that when this guy kept dropping, there wasn't going to be very many linebackers in the first round anyway. So, um, when, you know, my whole family, we're all over there. Everybody's watching the draft. And I'm just getting bored about it because, you know, I know I ain't going no time soon. You know, but I just knew that. And then when that guy kept dropping and I'd actually gone to the room probably around the 16th pick because I think Dan Morgan went ninth and he was the only linebacker in the first round. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was good, good, you know, great player and all of that. And come from a championship team and, you know, got the size and, you know, he's, he's you know, he's a first round uh, talent. But I knew there wasn't very many more needs for a linebacker in the first round. It just wasn't. And there were, you know, more need, more 
other positions needed, you know, more than they needed linebackers. Right. So I'd gone to the other room and I was sitting there laying down and I actually had fell asleep for a second and I woke up and um, I come back into the living room with everybody. And um, I think we were probably um, just starting the second round, I think, mm -hmm. or a couple picks in the second round. You know, and I saw Tom, uh, Kendra Bill go, and then I saw Tommy Polly go. And I figured, you know, hey, it's, it's probably around that time. I don't know. You know, it could be, could not. And all of a sudden, my phone rang, man. And um, it was Coach Richard Smith <laughs> from the 49ers, which when he called, I was just like, oh, my God, not that wait, guy. Wait, wait. Hold on, Jamie. I got to I got to pause you. Yeah. You get the phone call. Is it an area code or a phone number that you recognized? Well, you know, this phone number, this phone, I don't have, there's no, nobody has this number. Uh -huh. This this was just a regular uh, phone that I didn't give to anybody else. Nobody had that phone number. It was just a regular okay. phone. Yeah, okay. so, and um, it will, you know, it's actually my agent's phone or whatever, but that, you know, that's what it was, you know, designated for. And um, so, because because at the combine, the reason why I said Richard Smith, because at the combine, I mean, this guy was on my tail the whole time. Like, I had my hat turned to the side a little bit. And he's like, turn that hat around to the front. And then, you know, and he just was really on my case. But, you know, the guy loved me. He just was, a, you know, a hard-nosed coach. Right. And I was just, the uh, first thing I could think was, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be work. He's going to work my tail. Oh, my goodness. But um, it, it worked out perfect, man. Uh, Coach Rich Smith, you know, still to this day, we're really good friends. Um, and, you know, he was like a father figure, you know, reminded me of my, my you know, Coach Woody and my head coach, you know, and a, a number of other coaches in high school, you know, just really was looking out for my best interests. Jamie, did Coach Smith, was he your position coach at the Niners? Yes, yes. Coach Richard Smith, he was, uh, yeah, that was my position coach. So he calls you up and he says, Jamie, this is Coach Smith from the Niners. You ready to become a Niner? What, what did he say? Take us to that call. Man, you know what? He didn't say that at all. He said, he said, this is Richard. Hey, he said, Jamie Winborn, this is Richard Smith. I'm ready to work your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I was just like, oh, man. I was like, what's up, Coach, man? How you doing? He was like, you, you excited? I was like, yeah. He said, well, get all that shit out of your head because it's time to work. Your ass is getting ready to play. And I was and how like, many people, okay, coach. How many people are in the room when you're taking that call? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Oh. It was, no, no. I, I walked into the other room, you know, because I didn't want, you know. And because, and, you know, when they call you first, um, they call you, they called me. And as they were calling me, I started walking into the other room. And I didn't see myself on the screen. My family saw it. I see. Because I, I was talking to them. Then the pick came. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I had to go back and look at it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm going to pause you right there, Jamie. We got a whole bunch of Commodores who are in tonight. Thank you, guys. Jay Fish Escher, Beth Graves Dodd, uh, Dwayne Jones, <laughs> OJ Fleming, uh, Everett Robbins back, Tyler Hughes back, uh, Chris Lee, Scott Penny. They all sharing some love with you tonight, Jamie. Okay. We're we're going, we're talking about draft night. Mm -hmm. You get that call and you're the number, you're the round two pick of the Niners. And then uh, it's, it's a great night, I assume. You, you're, you're happy and, and dreams are coming true that night. Yeah, I, it, it was, man. Um, you know, it, it, it's real, man. Um, you, it was kind of like I was floating at that time. I, I, it was like, you know, everything that I've always, you know, worked, to, to do. I didn't think this was a, you know, I, you know, for so many years, I didn't think much of that, you know, of, of making it to the NFL and, and, and all of that until I got into college and started playing and stuff and got closer to it, you know. Once I got closer to it, you know, I was just hungry for it at that point. But, you know, to actually get that call, it was just like, man, you know, I'm the first one in my entire family to ever uh, do something like that. My, uh, you know, I'm the first, and I'm still the only person from my high school, Tom, to to go to the go to the pros, man. And um, you know, it it, it was just 
it was just unbelievable, you know, looking at the odds that I had coming up and all the stuff that I went through and all of that, you know, and um, I knew I put a lot of work into it, but I kind of just, you know, took it all in that night. You know, of course we went out and we parted a little bit that night, but you know, it's time to go the next day. Sure, but, uh, sure. but who, I, I, Wayne one reminded me to ask you, who was the Niners head coach at the time? Mariucci, Steve Mariucci. Mariucci, very good. And yeah, you, play, you played with the Niners for five seasons. Yeah, five seasons. Um, and actually, uh, you know, it's crazy because uh, the defensive coordinator at the time was uh, Jim. Uh, how could I forget Jim's name? I call him. I always call him Jim. Um, he, um, dang, his dad. How could I forget Jim's name? He'll come back to you, but Tyler wanted me to remind you he was celebrating with you in Atlanta that night on the party bus. Oh, you better believe it. Tyler knows what's up. <laughs> yeah, man, we had a good time, man. I, you know, it was a good, it was just a good day, man. Um, you know, and I, you know, I always looked out for my people, man, you know, because, you know, I, I had a lot of support, man. All my friends, man. Um, you know, honestly, they, they, they really, you know, even my, all my teammates at Vandy, they, they really supported me, man, for real. They, they really did. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that. And that meant a lot to me. And I, I still think about that to this day, you know, how, how, you know, everybody was just, you know, real supportive for, you know, for me to, you know, make that transition. I mean, along with the other guys as well, but, sure. you know, I was the highest guy that year. Um, well, let, but yeah. let me ask you this, Jamie. Uh-huh. Playing in the best conference in the country, the best against the best competition, you've got a pros pro for a head coach who yeah. specialized in defense. From a preparatory standpoint, you're headed in the right direction. But the college game and the pro game are whole different animals. What yes. moment was it when you got to the Niners that it just not that it dawned on you, because I knew you knew you were going into a completely different area. Uh, what was it? What clicked? What did you see? What did you hear that said, "This is the real deal"? And I, I've got to be a professional. Okay, I, I'll give you. I'll give you. You know, practice and stuff was. You know, they practice pretty hard, but um, you know, you're still not getting that game tempo yet. But I can tell you what it, when it was. It was the first game against the Chargers, San Diego Chargers. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. I was lined up on the right side, and uh, it was um, – I forgot my, the fullback's name, but I know it was LT in the back, you know, because um, we were on the Playboy All-American team together. So I, I, it looked like a lead draw to me. So I shoot in there real fast. And, and then I see the quarterback, you know, he doesn't give – he doesn't give the, give uh, LT the ball. So I said, dang, I, I got to stop my plant and I run back out. But as I'm running out, I turn my back to him, and then I kind of turned around. But as I turned around, I see, like, my buddy Julie and everybody just flying by, right? Mm -hmm. And by the time I actually looked to go to where the play was, Julian and all of them, they were running back to my next play, next play, little buddy, next play, keep going. And I'm just sitting here, like, saying, shit, this shit is fast out here. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking. I was like, game. man. The speed of the game. Yes, a whole play just almost went by me, and it's over, and we're getting ready for the next before I even got ready to go to this first play. Like, Did you ever see that play on film later on, and, and they get oh, on? Of course. <laughs> they like, you know, listen, because I only played one series uh -huh. at that time, you know, and and so, you know, I did okay after that, but, I, but that speed just then, like, how fast, like, you know, you really have to, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, the mistakes I made, was when I went in, you never turn your back to the quarterback. You you turn and you come out. So no, second mistake, first mistake, it wasn't a run. <laughs> Get out of there. Second mistake, don't turn your back to the quarterback. Third mistake, don't turn a complete circle when you turn it around. Always open back up to the plate. Mm -hmm. And so because I turned around, I missed everything past me. And so as I when I turned around and got ready to see what was going on. The plays over here, it was a screen. It was a fullback screen. Mm -hmm. And here I go, going to the play, and I'm and Julian's like, hey, next play, buddy, come on, let's go. He's jogging back to the huddle. 
And I'm just like, oh my God, I don't know what I got myself into, but I got to do better than that. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that was a quick lesson that you very quickly put in your, your memory bank. Well, yeah, it, never forgot you, must it. On, you must have caught on pretty quickly to stay in the league for 10 years. Now, I, I, <laughs> I don't want to, yeah, I, I, you know, one thing that Coach Smith always um, stressed, and um, you know, and 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 I and I caught on to that was he wanted you to hustle, you know. And if you just and if you just hustle, and you know, I had good speed, you know. Sometimes I'm flying around, but I'm flying the wrong direction. Right. But I'm, I can make up for certain stuff because I did have the speed. Mm -hmm. But as you play better and better teams, you know, you just gotta you you, you got to make sure you get that out of there. You know, you got to eliminate those mistakes because the better teams, there's just no time for it. So as I got better and continued to work and, uh, you know, because it became a, you know, getting to the pros, when you're in the pros, it's, 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 it's real different because now we spend a whole lot of time in there watching film. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn how to, I knew how to watch film. Mm -hmm. but not quite how the pros are doing it. You know, they're breaking that stuff down real quick and, you know, they don't have time to keep going back and, right. you know, they give me this book and, you know, when coach Smith gave me the book, the book was this big and I'm just like, huh, <laughs> learn what? All of that? He was like, I need you to know all of it because you're going to be controlling guys. Yeah. Who were some and, of the, the defensive players in the, in the Niners defensive unit when you were a rookie? Man, oh my goodness. I had, okay, this, my front two defensive linemen are Dana Stubblefield and Brian Young. Wow. I don't know if I need to go on, but, but then I'll go on to Andre Carter, and then we had John Engelberg over here. Mm -hmm. I even had, I even had, a, um, I played with, uh, no, Chris Hovan wasn't there. Hovan was at uh, Tampa, but, uh, we just had some guys, man. We had a guy that was semi, I can't think of his name now, but he was in rotation. But um, I had TKO Kiefer. Man, we had some dogs up front. Oh my, but see, and, and I, but what I loved about it was Dana Stubblefield and Brian Young, they knew I didn't know everything to do. Right. All they would say was, hey, you just made the call and you just fly like we know you can do and make the plays. We're going to keep them off of you. And that just meant the world to me because, you know, first of all, Brian Young and Damon Stubblefield even talking to me is cool to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, those and guys, were so big, they were so big and so strong and such space eaters. It probably freed up lanes for you to be able to find what you oh, need. Man. All I had to do was step back or, or take a step back mm -hmm. and just be patient. If it was, you know, and if it was a run and then boom, it just attacked. That's all I had to do. It wasn't that hard. I mean, you know, I got, you know, I got hit several times, you know, not because of them, but just in the game of football. But for the most part, man, it was just pretty, it made my job easy, man. And then when two Pro Bowl guys like that tell you as a rookie, we know you don't know what you're doing out here, but yeah. just do, you just run and fly around. I know you, you know, that, that they gave me the confidence that, hey, I, you're going to screw up, but just fly around and we're going to help you because we, you know, they had confidence in me yeah. and uh, oh, that man. meant a lot to me. I was going to say that probably helped you tremendously, but Jamie, as you're getting into your, your rookie year, your second year, your third year, at what point did you stop thinking and then just start playing? You became comfortable with the game, the speed of the game. You knew that the LTs of the world were just such special players. You had to be certain prepared for their their type of game. Did you ever get to that point, either your rookie year or later into your career? Yeah, it, it, it came more so for me, my one into my second year. You know, I ended up getting hurt my second year, but it was just more about seeing uh, seeing the different formations and the, seeing the different strategies of attack. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing, you know, cause it's pretty simple once you understand how they're trying to attack you and what they're trying to do to you. But my rookie year, I'm still, you know, I'm still shocked to see every new team, mm -hmm. you know, if I, you know, I was making plays and stuff. It's just, but it was still kind of, I, I couldn't tell you like, how could I explain it? Um, when you know the game, 
when if you if you tell me cover two, is two or three routes already that I'm thinking I have a chance to pick off. Sure. The game the game slows down for you mentally and physically because you know it. Yeah, but see, there's another level. Right. Which is which is understanding, you know, because I would call the the huddle. So mm -hmm. I used to want to look at the I like to look at the coaches uh his his um uh, his um uh, what do you call it the the dang I can't even think of the name of it for my mind goes so bad the cards or signals or no the the his play his play his call sheet oh okay basically what he's gonna call on first down second down first right. and ten you know right. first and second and eight stuff like that so I like to talk with the coordinator let get to know what he's he's thinking and how he thinks they're gonna try to attack us. Mm -hmm because I have that in my mind as I'm playing as well. But there's another level because I'm actually the one out here as well. So yeah. some things I can feel, but when I can get that general concept, because every every time I call a play, the coach doesn't always give you the call. You know, sometimes they, you know, they, you know, screw up over there on the sideline, but you can't just leave your guy stranded. Right, right. But I need to know approximately what is a safe call for us, what we probably would do right on this time. Well, it's, I remember watching you, you must have been around your fourth year of the night. I can't remember. It was, you weren't a rookie or a second year, but you were still very active in the schemes. And I'm thinking at this point, this man is on X Games mode because he knows what he's doing. He's calling yeah. the, the signals. But, and I don't want to rush through your NFL career, but there's some real stories that I do want to get to, Jamie. I mean, yeah. You and I know we could talk for hours. But I know that at some point you ended up having some pretty major surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it a play that, that led to this or was it just a cumulative effect of, of no. playing in the league? No, it was a play. It was Brian Young. And I still get on his butt about that today. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to, it was a screen play and I was in the left flats and I think it was Bianca Batuka and he, Brian Young was chasing him from behind. And I just, I was in the left flat. So I went to go tackle him. But Brian Young had dove. As soon as he was getting ready to cut, he did a spin move. So as I'm going to tackle him, Brian Young just hit me head on from the side. Wow. And that gave me a, you know, herniated disc. Real, really bad herniated disc in my, uh, in my neck. And, um, you know, I thought my career was over, at, you know, to be honest with you. And, you know, really the doctors told me that it probably should be over. But what year was that for you with the Niners? That was 2003. That was my third year. Third year? Yeah. And um, I just, you know, I just really thought, uh, you know, I prayed on it and, you know, went and got some of the best doctors out there, spent a lot of money trying to get back out there on the field. And they thought I was going to come back the year after that, you know, that not next year, but, you know, probably a little bit in the middle if I did have a chance to come back. But I actually did the work, put the work in, prayed about it. And um, I didn't even miss a mini camp. Well, I was going to say, Jamie, you, you ended up playing. Uh, I know you played for the Niners for five years. You got traded to the Jags. Yeah. And then in success, I think you then went Bucks, Broncos, yeah. Falcons, Texans and then concluded your career with the Titans. And that's where I want to go. Okay. You're coming back home, so to speak. You're back in the Southeast. You're in Nashville. What was that like to be joining the Titans, coming back to Nashville toward the end of your career? You know, it was real cool because I, I already had a relationship with with, with, uh, with Fisher, with, with Coach Fisher. You know, uh, when, when he first moved, you know, when they first moved here, you know, I used to see McNair and all of the guys out there in the parking lot, you know, back when, you know, McNair had the, you know, the blue um, Suburban with the suicide seats in it, you know, all of that, because they practiced in our stadium before they got the new uh, name, the Titans, and from the Oilers to the Titans, you know, with Blaine Bishop and watch it. And didn't they play maybe in Memphis for a little bit, and Nashville a little bit, and I, I remember yeah. the transition yeah. until they got to where they went across the river. Yeah, see, because they were at they were in Bellevue. Um, they were, I think they were out in Bellevue at at, at this uh, facility or whatever where you know the training they were you know because they had the 
trailers for trainer training and stuff like that out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I worked for Chris Cadillac at the time. So, you know, Coach Fisher, all of those guys had uh, dealer cars. Mm -hmm. So I would go out there to drop them off their cars, me and, and one of the guys that worked there. Mm -hmm. And I used to see guys out there all the time. I, I wouldn't say nothing or nothing, but I just would see them. And, you know, some guys knew where I was and stuff, but I just, I just already knew Fisher from that. And um, so when I when I came back to the Titans, you know, he already knew what kind of guy I was. And, you know, like I explained, you know, it's probably the end of my career, you know, but you know, if I'm gonna, you know, I'm not if I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna get out here, I'm gonna give it my all. You know, I can't cheat the game. I'm not gonna do that. So um, it worked out perfect, man. Um, as soon as I got there, man, I got busy in there and um, you know, it was real fun just to be back you know, in Nashville and around the guys and actually having a chance to play for the pro team here in Nashville, that was really cool too. And um, that's how where I ended my career. You, at that age, how old were you your final year in the NFL? 30. 30. Now, did you move back into Carmichael Towers that year and live it with some of the guys? No, I'm just kidding. With Heck you. no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> No, I saw I would see people and stuff, man. But um, yeah, I, I lived right across from the facilities, but you know, um, because I, you know, I didn't want to be far, um, because I was traveling back and forth from there to Atlanta, you know, because at that point, you know, when you're toward the end of your career, you don't know how things are actually going to go. And and my daughter was start had started school, and you know, I was just kind of getting tired of you know the move taking my daughter out of, out of daycare or out, out of this here, you know, I didn't want to do that to my kids anymore. So I figured that was probably going to be the end of it for me. And, and, you know, it's, it's probably good when a, when a, a professional athlete recognizes it's time to let the younger guys take, take the game going forward. It's, it's, it's hard to admit that. Uh, I still can't admit that, that my eligibility is over with. So I just want <laughs> But, but Jamie, you had a, a 10 year career and that's, that is to be applauded. As I said last night, it's, it's extremely rare these days for any pro athlete, regardless of the sport, to be able to, to keep his skills or her skills that long. But after you retired, things got pretty serious for you. And you went through a lot of life lessons that I know that we're going to get into just a little bit tonight. You've shared them publicly before. So this is not, not new. Uh, information that we're breaking here and I know you want to share your story so I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet for a couple of minutes and I want you to share whatever you feel like you want to you want to tell the folks well I mean um, you know I just you know, I had some uh, you know when I look at it nowadays and I look back on it I say you know I left myself uh, vulnerable for some things to happen to me um you know especially with you know when, when with the guns and stuff like that and and, and I'll break it down real easy for that. You know, I had a, a, I owned an apartment complex here and, you know, I'm a guy from Alabama and I like, you know, I like guns and stuff like that. So some of the people when I, when they wouldn't have their rent money and stuff, you know, they'd be late on their rent or whatever, you know, a couple of the guys that, you know, said, Oh, well, Hey, you know, I have this gun right here. Just hold, you can hold that until I pay you or whatever. And then half of them would always skip out, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't pay or whatever. So me not thinking much of it because it's not like I'm riding around with them or anything like that. But I would have them in my, I just would take them and put them in the control room at my home. Well, I didn't anticipate, you know, my my ex-wife, who was my wife at the time then, um, you know, I don't really know what really happened, to be honest with you, why she thought that, but she called the police to get some of the, to get the guns out of the house, you know, and I felt like, well, why didn't you just say that to me? And I could have did it. Because, but when she did that, um, some of the guns were, some of them had been stolen. Some of them had altered our, 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 our identification marks, but really were just two old, were old guns. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, the home was in my name. I wasn't even at the home. I was not there. But um, by being in my name, I ended up having to be in the one charged for all of that, even though I'm not there. Right. Um, so, and the reason I say I left myself vulnerable for that, because, you know, 
of course, you know, hell, I, I, if I if I had to check each gun, you know, went to the, I, I don't know, I guess went to the police station and said, hey, check this gun out and see if this gun's good, you know. But I, I'm not, I wasn't comfortable with police to do that, you know. And I didn't, and I wasn't gonna be riding around with it or, you know, anything like that anyway. Um, and and actually, I had probably, I had already, I had put the stuff in the basement in the control room, locked up and everything. But, um, you know, she took them to all of that stuff. So, <laughs> and um, they didn't need a warrant or any, anything. And, and that kind of put me in the eyes of the law, you know, um, mm. which wasn't a bad, you know, it worked out good. You know, luckily I had a judge that understood what was going on. And, um, but um, I ended up, you know, filing a, a, a divorce and going through the divorce procedures and stuff. And, and, um, <laughs> They really don't treat you very fairly when you when you know when you're an athlete. They really don't treat you very fairly. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, but it was okay, you know. I move on from that, but you know, it that put me in a mind state at that time where I just, you know, I almost began to hate the fact that I did play football, you know, that I made it to the NFL because I felt like that's what was hurting me within my, within my divorce and they treated me like this kind of person because of my who I was mm -hmm. and um because my you know on Instagram my name didn't used to be Jamie, Jamie Winborn you know I did I wasn't using my my name I was using nicknames and stuff mm -hmm. still here still here see ya Keep going. Jamie, I can't hear you. You're not on mute, so you need to probably turn your volume up, bud. <laughs> Jamie, can you hear me? I don't think you realize, I don't think we're connected right now. So we'll get him back in just a second, guys. Hey, Jamie, <laughs> this happens sometimes. Can't hear you. Your connection is not good. Can you hear me, okay, Jamie, now? Jamie, can you hear us? No. It's just a poor connection right now. Sometimes it happens. Let's try it again. Hold on just a second. Internet is being stubborn tonight. All right, Jamie, say something. Let's see if we've got a good connection now. We can see you just fine, bud, but just can't hear you. Jamie, if you can hear me, sign off and then sign back in one more time. I know, wanted to tell you guys while we've got a minute, if you go back onto our, our Facebook group, made a connection today with a couple of folks who y'all have seen in the news of late and, and just so happy and proud for, for Cody Markell um, and Turner Cockrell's family. They both have joined the Facebook group Cody just received a very prestigious honor in the SEC for the work that he's done with Turner's heroes. Please go read that story. Check it out. It, it, there was a great Zoom call with Commissioner Sankey today with Coach and uh, Coach Mason and, and the, the two families, Cody and, and the, uh, the Cockrell family. It's just outstanding. So happy for him and that they've they found each other and they're doing such great work. Cody's going to come on the show in August and um, hopefully he'll get to share what he's been up to. 
All right, I'm going to see if we can get Jamie back into the Zoom call, and we'll finish up with Jamie because he's sharing some of his, his life story with us, some real meaningful stuff and, and stuff we can all learn from. So I really appreciate him sharing that with us. All right, Jamie, let me unmute you and let's see if we can pick it back up. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now, bud. I'm sorry. Where, where the last thing that we heard, bud, is that you had uh, you were in the middle of a divorce. You were not happy the fact that you had played in the NFL, probably because it set you up on a pedestal and made you a target. Yeah, definitely, man. And um, you know, and um, and actually, to be honest with you, before before that even happened, I, I just I don't know how my mind's so crazy. My mind is a little slower now, y'all. Forgive me, but I, you know. Before that even happened, I was diagnosed with the cancer. Mm -hmm. So I'd already been struggling with that, um, you know, you know, because it was life changing for me. Um, the cancer was, uh, you know, for those that don't know, I had, you know, colorectal cancer. Uh, I headed to stage what? I headed to stage two, um, but I'd lost a lot of weight um, and, and um, ended up having to have a colostomy bag and. How you know, old were you, Jamie, when you were diagnosed? 32. And so you had retired from the NFL and were living in Atlanta at the time? Yeah, you know, I actually, from what the doctors were saying, I, I actually had that cancer my last year playing with the Titans. Wow. See, what it was was that, you know, and it's crazy because in the NFL, you know, they don't do any screening for you for anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I was having times where I was, lying to the coach and saying I had to go to the bathroom when really what it was was I was hurt mm -hmm. and I'd be in the bathroom just really bawling because but I didn't know what it was mm -hmm. I just had this and I could not keep weight I could you know they had me on this real strict program of eating and mm -hmm. I just couldn't keep weight so I still would be in pain but I'd, I'd have to go back out there and, and, and finish playing for the day you know mm -hmm. you know I and 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 that kind of, it kind of did something to me, I think, because I knew right then that I, you know, I, I knew I was a special person, you know, and that's how I felt about it because I knew I was, because here I was at nine on seven smashing, you know, with fullbacks and stuff like that. When I'm having a pain out of this world that I don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. But once I figured out what it was, you know, because I didn't tell people for a long time you know, cause I was ashamed of, cause I didn't really know what it was anyway. Right. I was right. losing weight. I, 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 but you know, I could, I could never really keep good weight during the season anyway. And, um, and I would, I would go in the bathroom all the time and just really just be boohooing to myself sure. in pain because I couldn't explain the pain, you know, and, what and um, allowed you, what allowed you to ultimately come to learn your diagnosis did you have some type of a procedure or a test yeah I, man i i went to like five different doc the fifth doctors who found it what they the first time they I, they told me i had a stomach uh i had food poisoning you know and then you know you got to wait and wait and wait to you know to test your stool and all that good stuff and then one of them said i had h pylori or something like that and then it I then went back to food poisoning and, and you know, and I'd gotten two colonoscopies and they didn't see it. Wow. wow. And then all of a sudden I go to this last doctor because I'm just like, this something just I'm something ain't right. It's just not I I'm hurting, you know, and I'm losing weight and I'm I know something's wrong. And that last doctor I went did another colonoscopy and all of a sudden he came out and, and just said, you know, I know you don't want to hear this, but you know, you got a tumor. And I was like, you mean a tumor like cancer? <laughs> That's what I told him, told the doctor. I was like, you mean cancer? And she was like, yes. And I was like, quit playing, man. Get out of here with that. Like, I just, I just didn't know how that could be. You know, I, I really, I, I never forget that day. You know, you know, you talk about being drafted and talk about getting a scholarship and, and any of that stuff. But the truth is that was, uh, that was a turning day for me in my life. Well, you know, it, it, it doesn't bookend things, but you go from this conversation with the professor and the, the making the decision that it's time to go to the pros. 
then you're Superman for about 10 years in the NFL. I'm sure you yeah. have to have a mentality that you can't be beat because you can't have the other mentality playing in the pros, particularly, exactly. particularly your position. You then retire, and now you're at the other end. Your body's defying you somewhat, and you're being told you've got cancer. Yeah. How, how long did yeah. you treat it? How, how long was your – did you have surgery? What was the protocol? What did you do? Well, I had um... – my the first thing was uh what was it 25 or 30 sessions of uh radiation wow and 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 which is crazy because and and it really the radiation ends up severing the nerve to my bladder mm -hmm. so no longer am i am i a person that uses the bathroom the same way as other people you know well i use it like they do but i'm i don't feel it until it's too late mm -hmm. or sometimes mm -hmm. you know and uh to the point where I had, I would have to wear, you know, the pins here and there, you know, and I really didn't like that, but um, I gotta stay alive. So then I ended up after the radiation, then I had to, that was to try and shrink the tumor. And then all, of, then I had to do the, the surgery. Well, the first surgery, which was uh, the port in my chest, preparing to be able to take the chemo and then I had the surgery where they would remove the tumor web and then I had to wear a colostomy bag for six months. But in those six months, that's when I'm taking the chemo. I, you know, and I wear a chemo, I go do the session for four and a half hours, then I take the chemo pack home and it runs for another 48 hours and I gotta go back and get it flushed out and all of that good stuff and it, it just was, you know, everything, your life changes. It just changed instantly, mm -hmm. you know. Jamie, what, what did your weight get down to? About 156. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. play, and, and what was your, your playing weight? What was your highest? I, I know it was like 225, something like that. But, you know, wow. in, a, in about a month, month and a half, man, I really just dropped quickly, you know. Uh, toward, the, toward that last year, I was probably like 210. And what, Jay, now, where, where are you now with your care, if you don't mind? With my uh, cancer? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in, it's in remission, man. Um, I just, uh, I actually got a colonoscopy. I got to go get ready to tap. It was, it was scheduled before this pandemic stuff started or whatever, but I kind of put it on hold. But, you know. I, I just got to get that, you know, every couple of, every, every couple of, it, it used to be every six months and then it moved to like every year and then a little bit longer now. So it's time for me to check it in and, uh, you know, I feel like it'll be fine. Um, you know, given what I had to go, what I went through, I have up days, down days anyway, you know, mm -hmm. so I can't really just say, Oh, I'm not feeling so good, but it's right. just been that way since I already started that. So, um, you know, the biggest thing, and honestly, man, is just keeping your mind into it, um, you know, and that, and that, because I, I talk to a lot of people that are dealing with cancer now, um, you know, a lot of people come to my page on my, you know, Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and, and, and a lot of people that just know me as a person that has been a cancer survivor, I, you know, I do a lot of mentoring to other cancer patients. Wow, good for you. Good and, for you. Um, you know, and I just tell them the same thing that I, what happened for me, what, what what worked for me was, you know, you know, it's all about your mindset, you know, as far as, you know, you got to smile, you got to continue to laugh, find a way to laugh and find a way to smile. Um, stress is your worst enemy, you know, and, um, you know, I have a J pouch now, you mm -hmm. know, which, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, but it's still, I'm working. Um, so. I, you know, I have days where I where I get down on myself. You know, I can slip into depression. Sure. Um, you know, just you know, when you go through a long night, just like the other night, I, you know, a couple of nights ago, you know, between twelve o'clock and six o'clock, I probably went to the bathroom fourteen times. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm washing my hands fourteen times, I'm not sleeping, and I'm not. I don't want to go. I, I'm, you know, I'm just not going to sleep. So, you know, you have a couple of days like that. You know, it just. And then I started thinking about, you know, the fact that, man, I, you know, it's just crazy how everything just changed like that. But, you know, there's way more people worse off than me. Um, and I realized that and I don't, you know, I don't look at that just to 
be happy about it, but I have to be realistic and say, hey, man, that's not even the worst thing. So, you know, pick your chin up and, and, and get your ass back in the ring. What's wrong with you? You know, well, I will tell you from an outsider's perspective, not having known you except from afar, watching you play at Vanderbilt and in the pros, you know, you're you're one of my heroes, bud, because you you don't let that affect what you're going on out there. And you're you're such an inspiration to so many people. And, and I hope you appreciate yeah. that. And I think you do because you see so many people, as you mentioned a minute ago, are, are in much worse situation. And anything you can do to lift their spirits or guide them a little bit, man, props right here. Absolutely. I love that. And you it's know? Not easier from we tough guys say that. Bam, my proud. <laughs> but, it, it, and I don't want to. I, I, we're almost finished, Jamie, and I sure appreciate you spending way more than 20 minutes tonight with us and sharing your story. I, I think it's such an important story, especially for all of us in Commodores Nation. And, and we all, you know, we, we love the, the players on and off the field. You know that. And that's what this space is all about. So I appreciate you sharing yes. as you have tonight. Um, talk to us just for a few minutes as we get close. What keeps you busy these days? I know you, you're a proud dad. I know you got you got stuff that keeps you busy. So share with us. Catch us up just a little bit before we get out of here for the night. Well, like I like I mentioned before, our, 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 the mentoring man. Um, you know that that means a lot to me. So, you know, I you know I kind of feel like God spared my life. Um, you know, so I, I in order to help others, and that's 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 you know. I've been searching for see what what it is that he want me to do for so long, and I just couldn't find it. I just didn't, you know. It's not. I, I just didn't know, and I couldn't find it. I couldn't. It's not something you can look for. But I figured that through all the stuff that I've been through, I I feel I, well. I found that what makes me feel good is when I can help other people. You know what I mean? When somebody else can say, "Man, I just appreciate you talking to me," because man, I was about to go off the deep end. That's the that's you know that's that's a 15 tackle game for me. You, you know, Jamie, it's the greatest gift that I have found that a person <laughs> can give to another is their time. Yes. And just giving that time, what you're telling mm -hmm. me right now, that's just, it doesn't matter what yeah. you do, or what you say, it's just showing up and just being there for another person. That, that, that is. Well, because, you know, I mean, a lot of people always ask, you know, ask me if I'm, you know, into what businesses and all that good stuff I'm into. And, and, and um, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not into a lot of that right now um, because I, you know, I had to choke down and, and, and just take that, take life one day at a time because, you know, I, I, the stress was part of what, you know, stress is part of what brings cancer to, to a person. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just, you know, reduce the things down to get in a position where I don't have to really, do working, you know, as hard and stuff like that no more. So, you know, so I like to, you know, talk to kids, and, you know, give kids hope and, and um, you know, talk to people that really need it um, out there. And, uh, you know, I like to do that and spend time with my kids and be there for them and, you know, pop up on them in school. <laughs> you know, I like to do stuff like that um, because I found a, another complete other family other than just the football that I, uh, family that I have, which are people that are in the world that are in struggle and need mentally. So, you know, I just spoke to, uh, I think it was Union City Jail for women. They had a graduation for the, the, a mental program that uh, my buddy and, and my cousin Cornelius Henderson down in out and from he's from we talked to Alabama, but he created that program in the jail here. You know, he has a nice job and and, and it's real creative and they had a graduation down there. I think you can look back on my Facebook and see it, but you know, man, stuff like that meant a lot to me um, to go into the jail, which is kind of crazy for me because I didn't really want to go into jail. <laughs> but this is like one of the only times I've ever seen somebody them allow inmates to have a graduation for this particular program that dealt with mental illness and, you know, drug addiction and stuff like that. And I just really thought that that was just a big deal. And that's why I committed to doing it. And, um, you know, I really like doing that because people, you know, everybody has this facade in life that everything is all great. Oh, everything's perfect, perfect, perfect. But, you know, 
the truth is, is that people, you know, within a day, you know, you have so many ups and downs mentally in a day and thoughts of the past or how you grew up or things that you would like to change and stuff like that to where you have to keep that stuff level and you have to find a way to keep all of that stuff in front of you yeah. and, 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 and in a safe place because it's really simple and real easy for you to feel a different way to you end up in a position where you're in trouble somewhere or it's just a real critical situation where you're riding, people are riding down roads, really contemplating whether or not they're gonna drive off the road, or you know, riding yeah. around with guns in the car, wondering if they're gonna rob some, or you know, all this stuff has to do with mental issues. And you know, people don't know how to you how to deal with it. Yeah, it's so hard to keep it even yeah. mentally. I, I get it, because you're not gonna put your crappy days on Instagram or on social media. Exactly. You're not gonna do that. Exactly, but they exist. I understand. And it's dangerous, and um, so that's what I like. That's what I work on, and that's what I do. You know, that's what I do now. I, I mean, I work with a number of different uh, programs and 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 people, and um, you know, my phone rings all the time with me having to do stuff like that, and and I and I and I try to do it as much as I can, man, because that that you know, it it helps me as a person, um, in my development as a person and it's something I feel that God wants me to do you know and it makes me feel good and knowing that I really made a change that was really significant you know mm -hmm. anything that I did out there on the football field that you know that really ain't nothing in my head you know it's, a, it's an accomplishment but it's not anything that from human to human mm -hmm. I can say relate we relate on that you know um, but we all relate with feeling like it's a shitty crappy day <laughs> you know, well, Jamie, I, I certainly have, you have many, many more of those awesome days ahead. I know yes. you will. And I look forward to the day we go get some barbecue in Elmore County and break some bread together. <laughs> I'm up the for it. It's over. Well, guys, one of the Commodore greats, you know, I could sit here and talk to this man for hours, but we all got stuff to do. Absolutely. And I, I want to thank you, Jamie, for sharing your story keeping it raw and real and telling us how it's been. So thank you, sir, for doing that. All right. I appreciate y'all, man. See y'all later. All have right, a guys, good one and, have a good one and stay protected, man. Yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. Couldn't say it any better. But guys, we'll be back next Thursday.